Good afternoon or good morning, dependent on where you are in the world today. Welcome to today's joint masterclass with INSEAD. I'm Karen Doyle and I'm director of CTAM Europe. We are delighted today to welcome Noah Askin, there he is on screen, who is INSEAD's Assistant Professor of Organisational Behaviour. Noah is ready to educate and enlighten us all on the world of networking in our new reality. Noah is one of the faculty members who also teaches our CTAM Europe Executive Management classes at INSEAD each year. Alongside Noah, we have Louise Cottrell there, CTAM Europe's co-chair and Louise's everyday role is SVP Affiliate Partnerships at AMC Networks International. Um, we will give you a very short introduction on our executive management programme, which is happening at INSEAD in June 2020 on the 6th to the 11th. Today's masterclass is scheduled for an hour and will include a Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, please submit them using your Q&A button. And if you have any further questions after the webinar, you can always email info at ctameurope.com. So we'll kick off now with, by starting um, with a quick one minute video of our programme and then Louise and Noah will take it away. Thank you. CTAM Europe, Executive Management Programme at INSEAD. An intensive, comprehensive learning and development experience developed for the connectivity and entertainment industry. A programme to help industry leaders stay one step ahead of the changes in our industry. At the inception of the five-day programme, we chose to partner with INSEAD, the business school for the world, whose global MBA programme has been ranked as the number one programme in the world for two consecutive years. Senior executives at the top of the organisations have the time to reflect and think about the seeds and trends of change during the five-day programme. The programme has helped over 150 senior industry leaders become better leaders throughout the past years. The classes are generally around 20 to 30 participants and therefore chances for discussions throughout the week are extensive. In addition, there are some fabulous organised networking and social events. New contacts are made and nourished throughout the week and beyond. We hope to welcome you or your organisation's leaders onto our next programme. Thank you, and uh, nice to know everyone is here um, virtually on another of our CTAM webinars. So really just a very quick intro from me. I think last time I, I spoke on one of the webinars um, and introduced them, we were at the beginning of lockdown. So they were very bizarre times, strange times, but of course now they've become regular times. Um, we're getting used to the new situation. We are adapting to, to, to new times. And some companies, I think, are progressing faster than others. But everyone realizes that they have to do more. Things, I think, are clear, are not going to go back to exactly how they were before. And I think everyone is well aware of that. Whilst the novelty may have worn off, companies and individuals are having to learn new habits to work as effectively and efficiently as possible in, in this new world. And all of that outside what were perhaps more formal structures before, you know, we're having to work from home and, and work out what our new structures are. So a lot happening um, and I am in sales. My job is very much partnerships and relationships. I'm working across global territories, which means some have perhaps more internet rigor than others. Cultures make things um, difficult. There's a lot happening and I think um, networking has become more important than ever social relationships are more important than ever but they've become harder than ever yet we really need to maintain um, existing relationships we also need to build new ones we need to perhaps nurture those that are more distant maybe that have been traditionally more difficult but we also need to build our own uh, teams and help them build their own networks that may be still fledgling um, networks and things so we also need to build that in so i think the point is relationships are important as ever if not even more than before, and we're in this virtual world. So um, Noah Askin, Assistant Professor of Organisational Behaviour at INSEAD, with whom we've had long partnership, is going to tell us a little bit more about networking in our new reality. So I hand over to Noah. Thank you very much. Great. 
Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you, Karen, CTAM, for having me. Thank you to those of you who've showed up uh, here on the webinar today. Uh, I imagine some of you are getting a little webinar out. Uh, there seems to be a glut in the marketplace of webinars these days. So thank you for coming today. Um, a topic that I think is, is always relevant and interesting, and I think has become, as Louis said, even more so uh, given the nature of our, of our world and confinement or, or restrictions on who and where and when we can socialize. Uh, and so that's really kind of the motivation to put this together. Um, uh, the way this is gonna work, I will probably talk for somewhere between 35 and 45 minutes and then open it up to Q&A. Uh, Louise and Karen will be watching the, the Q&A in, in Zoom, so please feel free to type in questions there. Um, and that'll give us hopefully 10, 15 minutes at the end to answer questions. I'm happy to stick around a little bit longer uh, should you have questions. Um, but what I always like to do at the beginning of these webinars, because it's very difficult, right? When you're in a classroom situation, it's very easy to bring everybody in together and to sort of feel like you know who's there and where they're coming from and, and sort of develop a rapport. And that's not quite so easy to do. And it's actually a fundamental aspect of networking, although that's not necessarily the main reason that I do it. But what I'd like to do is to do a quick check-in to begin. Um, so if you have a, a phone, a laptop, uh, an, uh, tablet, whatever it might be. Uh, if you want to go to menti.com, you don't need to have a, a subscription or anything like that. You can scan the QR code, whatever you find easiest, uh, just to check in and to get asked about, I think, four questions just to kind of see who you are, where you are, what you're, what you're up to. Uh, and that gives everybody sort of a nice sense of, of kind of who's in the room, especially for me. Uh, so there you go. Uh, you should be able to actually see the code on there too. There we go. Okay, first question, easy enough. Where, where are you coming to us from today? Home, thank you for whoever, for whoever chimed in that you're, you're writing from home. Uh, I suppose that's a legitimate answer to the question. Um, Nashville, from Nashville to Singapore, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good spread there. If you're having any difficulty with this, don't worry. We'll we'll just be in in Mentimeter for a minute or two. Um, but please hop over there uh, again from a phone, a tablet, a laptop, whatever, um, so you can respond to these. Okay, so. The London, the best represented, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, given where CTAM's base, although some, some US there as well and across Europe all the way to, to Asia. So good spread of people from, from around the globe, it would appear. Um, getting a little bit more to, to know a little bit more about you. Um, what industry do you work in? And you can be as general or as specific as you like. So a good, uh, good breakdown of CTAM. That's not, again, not, not all that surprising considering. Um, interested to see where, where everybody's coming from. Heavy, heavy in media and uh, entertainment for sure. Um, cool. Nice mix there. Uh, and just by way of background, a lot of my research actually is in music and the music industry, uh, focusing on creativity. Um, and so I use data from Spotify, from Deezer, uh, from record labels uh, as a means of, of studying how creativity spreads and how teams work together to, to be more creative. So it's uh, particularly relevant and interesting for me to see people that are in, in media and entertainment. Question three, uh, just to get a sense of who's, who's in the room here, what level, roughly speaking, uh, are you in your organization? OK. 
Okay, so a nice mix. It's interesting. I put this slide in initially thinking, oh, you know, people that are sort of in the middle of their career, you know, networking is most relevant for them. But then I started thinking, well, actually, the most senior people, that's really where it is the most valuable. But the most junior, you also have to be good at networking. So then I decided that actually, this is just for me to get a sense of where everyone is, because it kind of is important, regardless of where you are in your career. Um, okay, great. And then last question, and then we're going to hop, in, hop into content, but this is good to see the mix of people that are here with us and, and things like that. How would you describe your approach to networking since the start of the COVID crisis, right? We're about six plus months in now, um, and research on, on networks and networking and families suggests that in times of crisis, we actually tend to tend to close in. We, our worlds become smaller. We, we fall back on those that are most core and most central. Um, but it also, this, this situation presents an opportunity to really say, okay, everybody's been, the playing field has been somewhat leveled. Everyone's in front of their computer now. Uh, and so maybe there's opportunities to actually engage in, in growing my network a little bit more. Um, which runs counter to a lot of what, what you might expect, but it is something that could be really, really valuable. Uh, as you think about your career moving forward, this is, presents an opportunity during this time period. Cool, so across the board, um, tend to be you know, slight, slight advantage for focused on smaller networks, but more or less spread across about the same, some engaging more, some less, um, but good. So you know, that, that's helpful, it gives me a sense of who I'm talking to, where I'm talking to, what industries, and now you have a sense of who else is, is in here with you. Uh, so with that in mind, let's, let's jump in. Um, and, and the purpose of this is to give you some, some very tangible things that you can do, some practical takeaways that you can have in mind as you're trying to grow your network uh, moving forward, whether it's starting tomorrow, over the next six months, over the next six years. Uh, and that was how I approached developing this and, and pulling in from different resources to get you to be thoughtful about developing your network. Um, so what I hope you leave with today, uh, basically four, four main ideas. Uh, you know, first and foremost, that networking is like any other activity that you engage in, that it is good for you, but you may not like it first. Uh, habit formation and having goals is essential. Um, and I'm going to draw some analogies when we, when we get to that section. Uh, two, you absolutely have to do your homework. I don't care if you're the most senior member of your, your 5,000, 50,000 person organization or you are just starting. You need to know who you're talking to, what matters to them, what they care about, regardless of who you're reaching out to, even if it's somebody that you've met previously. Uh, number three is, is something, a suggestion that I'm going to make to you, something that I've put into practice and that I've actually now started to, to see other people putting into practice because I've talked to a number of people about it and I've, I found it to be quite uh, effective and it's about hosting your own office hours, um, even if you're not an academic. And then finally, around building your own personal board of directors. Uh, and I can't take credit for coming up with the idea. That actually comes from a guy named Gibson Biddle, who's the former VP of product at Netflix, um, who has taught on some programs with me. Um, I direct a product executive program at INSEAD, and so I got to know him through that. And I'm, I'm borrowing and, and embellishing on his idea a little bit, uh, so I want to give him credit, but I think it's a wonderful idea. So that's what I hope you walk away with today. Um, but let's begin. Um, and it's probably self-evident, uh, and this group of people, if assuming you signed up for this, don't need to understand why, but, but it's worth just taking a moment to say, okay, wh what's the value of networking? Like, why, do I, why should I do this? Um, and you can think about it from a number of perspectives. The one I want you to take is around your personal capital. And you personally have multiple forms of capital, but there's two I really, that are the biggest and that I want to focus on. Your human capital, that's your knowledge, your skill set, uh, and, and the like, and then your social capital. Those are the connections and disconnections among the people that you know. And over the course of your career, no matter where you are right now, one of these is going to matter more than the other. And given that networking is the theme of this, you probably imagine and probably guessed that I was going to say that it's social capital. Over the course of your career, moving forward from wherever you are right now, social capital will matter more towards your success and your eventual, you know, sort of you're moving up the ranks, you're getting new opportunities. And the reason is not because human capital doesn't matter. I don't want you to take that away. It's just that when you get to certain levels, especially more senior levels in organizations, human capital tends to not have great variance across people, right? You all have a certain level of skill, a certain degree of knowledge, and you grow that, but it tends to not vary that greatly across people within certain levels of an organization. So then what differentiates you from somebody else, right? If your capabilities and your ability to get things done are comparable, what differentiates you? Well, who knows you? Who likes you? Who wants to work with you? 
How well can you get things done? How can you accomplish tasks through other people, through your team, right? All of those things are actually what gives you the additional benefit. It's how you get noticed, put on better projects, et cetera. And so this isn't to say that you should avoid human capital and growing your knowledge, growing your skill set. Absolutely do that. But recognize that that's table stakes. That just gets you in the door. What gets you advanced beyond that is your social capital. It's your knowledge of who do you have in your network and what can I basically accomplish with and through them and vice versa. Other people have you in their network as part of their social capital. And importantly, social capital is not something that you yourself possess. It is possessed amongst the people in your network. Human capital you take with you everywhere you go. Your social capital, it's not as portable. Any of you that have left the company and started someplace new know that at your last job, you probably had a decent amount of social capital if you were there for long enough but it's not as portable. It's not that you lost those connections. It's just that in that new company, in that new role, they no longer are valuable. And so while human capital sort of goes up over the course of your life and maybe plateaus, but it sort of is always moving upward, social capital is a lot more variable. And so it's worth recognizing that you're gonna invest time in this and you wanna be thoughtful, not just about what's gonna be helpful in three months or six months, but the fact that you know three years from now, you may be somewhere else and your social capital is gonna look a little bit different. And so how can you be thoughtful about that? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense of, of why you should be thinking about this, why networking is valuable. And so, you know, it's, if social capital matters so much, where exactly does it come from? Um, you can think about there's, there's two types of two extremes of network properties. Um, and on one hand, you have closure, you have closed networks. Think about like your core team at work or your family unit or your closest group of friends that have been, you know, you've all been friends for a long time. That tends to be characterized by closure. And what that means is, you know, everybody kind of knows each other pretty well and they're all pretty friendly. And it actually is, is a very tight knit group. There's not a lot of externals who can break into that particular group. Uh, and on the other hand, you've got brokerage. And what do I mean by brokerage? All I mean is bridging two or more unconnected groups of people or individuals. And so you can see just a sort of a sample map here of what brokerage looks like. And somebody that's kind of distantly connected, not part of your close core unit, that's something that we call a weak tie. They're not your closest friends, they're kind of your acquaintances. And th those are gonna be really important. We're gonna come back to them. Um, and I should say that these are two ends of a spectrum and they're pretty extreme, right? It's pretty rare that you'll ever encounter a group that has complete closure. If you do, you've probably encountered some sort of cult uh, so you should avoid that. Uh, and if you encounter somebody that's a pure broker, that's probably somebody who's like, uh, I don't know, criminal mastermind playing people off each other or something like that. And so the, the point here is just that these are two extremes and they're useful for painting the picture, but chances are your networks and you have multiple networks are going to fall somewhere, somewhere in between these two. But I want you to keep, keep these ideas in mind. And what's interesting or sort of most relevant for this particular talk today about these two is they kind of represent two very, very different perspectives, at least when it comes to information. Uh, when it comes to as novel information, especially, think about closure. The thing about closure is we tend to be friends, our closest core group of friends uh, or team tends to look a lot like us. Maybe not physically, but values, background, culture, uh, you know, where, where they grew up, um, socioeconomic status. If you look at your five to seven closest friends, they probably look a lot like you and their worldview is probably a lot like you. And the closer you are with someone, the more likely your network and theirs overlap, which means that as information comes in, you're not getting access to anything new or different or sort of far removed from your immediate surroundings. And so the, the metaphor here is that closed networks are somewhat similar to drinking your own bathwater, at least when it comes to information. Uh, I realize that's graphic and maybe a little gross. Um, I can tell you that my three-year-old does this. It's gross, that's not him. Um, but the, the point is that, that it's when it comes to information, you're just kind of getting the same things over and over again from your closest group. Now, this is changing a little bit as the world becomes more global and, and globally connected and our friends tend to be scattered a bit more. But you can think about even on your team at work, Right? If you just kind of stick in your own core team and it's not across different silos or, asp or parts of the organization, you tend to kind of view the same world the same way, you think the same way, you have the same perspectives, and that feels nice, but it, doesn't, it means you're not getting access to new and different perspectives and ideas. And if that's the case with closure, that makes brokerage more like freshwater. 
right? If you have access to these weak ties to diverse connections across different areas of your, of your life and different areas of the world, you're much more likely to have access to novel and different and distinct information. And that's crucial. And so when we think about networking, this is where I want you to think about it. It's not that you should avoid your closest friends. No, that's, that's safety, that's comfort, that's trust. But when it comes to um, uh, accessing new and different information, you really wanna focus on who's new, who's distinct, who has access to things that are beyond my normal reach. So with that in mind, as kind of our foundation, how can you think about developing your network, especially when you're working and, and essentially living remotely? Um, <clears throat> and usually when we talk about networking, the first reaction that a overwhelming majority of people have is, well, I'm not really good at that. I've seen people who just are great at shaking lots of hands and that's not me and they can chat up anyone. It feels gross. I hate networkers. Um, and, and I should say two things. First of all, I'm not talking about sort of coordinated events where everybody like puts on their name tag and goes and sits around a cocktail table and eats small food and has drinks. I, that's not networking. That's just gross. It is. It's uncomfortable. We don't like it. And there's actually been research that shows that over 90% of people that go to those events don't talk to somebody they didn't already know. So those are not super, super effective. Maybe you have a story where it's been successful for you or someone you know in general. That's not what I mean here. I'm talking about any opportunity you have to meet somebody new or different. Uh, and so point one was, you know, sort of reconstructing how you think about networking or these networking events. Point number two is you really want to take, take the opportunity to say like, I don't necessarily have to go out and network. I'm going to relationship build. And that sounds like a marketing, you know, maybe it sounds like marketing BS, but the slight shift in how you, how you change your perspective and how you view it actually might make it much more comfortable. It's about relationship building. A means you're not necessarily having to go meet new people and B it's about actually developing human contact with someone as opposed to being instrumental. Right? I'm just going to someone because I need something from them. That's why networking feels awful is because I'm just doing this because I want or need something from them. Interestingly, I have a friend, a colleague who has done research on this. And actually what, what he did is they broke the concept of networking into two, two different aspects. First, there's making or strengthening ties. And then there's the aspect of value exchange. And most people tend to think about the first part, right? It's just about meeting new people. But actually a huge aspect of networking and maybe the most fundamental aspect is like what actually gets exchanged in a networking, in a, in a relationship. And so what he did is he started to, to a survey of people and looked at their personality traits and tried to figure out, okay, you know, yes, we know that extroverts are actually better at making ties initially, right? They're more comfortable with it than introverts are. But when it comes to value exchange, both giving and taking, they're not as good at it. Uh, and so this, he broke this down in a couple ways, first looking at personality traits, and then also looking at perspective. Do you view it as networking and do you view it as relationship building? And I wanna draw your attention to two, two things. First is the personality type of openness, which is related to curiosity. How open are you to new experiences, to trying new things, to being, to openness to the world, basically. People that were high on openness were not only more likely to make ties, but they're much more likely to give and, give and take when it comes to exchange in networking ties. And then, like I said, reframing the people that framed it as relationship building as opposed to networking were both more likely to make new ties and to give and take uh, value from the relationship. And so it starts with that subtle mind shift, uh, mindset shift. It's, that's, that's, you know, that's the easy part, right? Just reconstructing it. Even if you say to yourself, I know that this is just sort of marketing, but just trying to change your perspective a little bit away from pure networking to relationship building is a first step but it's only one step. Um, and, and so it's before giving you the specifics about how you wanna go about doing this, it's worth reminding you of our, our biases as humans. Uh, first of all, we are biased towards people that are similar to us. Remember I said enclosure, they're, you're drawn to people that tend to look and view the world like you do. In sociology, we call that homophily, homo meaning the same and philly meaning liking or loving. We like those who are like us. It's just easier to get along with them. We're drawn to people who are like us. Uh, and so that's a, a major bias when it comes to seeking out new friends, new contacts. Uh, number two, we are biased by proximity. We tend to talk to the people that are easiest to talk to because they're close to us. They were our neighbors. They lived across the hall. Their office was next to ours. There was research that was done 
that looked at basically how far away people's offices were from each other and how often they communicated. And as soon as they got um, away from about 10 meters or more, the probability of communicating more than once a week dropped very to almost zero, right? Maybe they communicated once, that was about it. So you're much more likely to stay in your immediate circle. Now that changes when we're virtual, but when you're in the office, you're much more likely just to talk to the people that you sort of walk by on a regular basis. Three, inertia. We tend to repeat interactions and communications with the same people in the same groups over and over again. That's natural and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does bias our behavior towards one, towards people that we already really know and developing those relationships further as opposed to seeking some novelty. Uh, and, and it was possible to overcome these biases in an office environment, right? You run into people headed to the photocopy or the bathroom, the coffee area, lunch, whatever it was. You could actually start to interact with people that you didn't know kind of by accident. Not everybody does, not everybody did, <clears throat> but it was possible. In a, in a post-COVID world, how do you overcome these biases? It's really hard because we're just drawn to the people we already know. So some thoughts, some, some ways to go about doing this. Uh, first and foremost, when it comes to networking, it's forming any new habit. And it's all about, you know, putting in the work, right? Networking, right? Work is in, in the word there. It's 1% inspiration, 1% being good at it, 1%, 1%, okay, I've read all the books about it and I understand this and I know how to, how to chat, pe chat to people and, and have a good conversation. But at the end of the day, it's 99% hard work. Right, and, and this is an analogy that I get from a colleague of mine, Koku Ibarra, who's in Singapore, who studies attitudes towards networking. And he, he likens it to going to the gym, right? You don't get in shape by reading all the blogs and buying all the equipment, that helps. But at the end of the day, you don't get in shape until you actually like get up and start exercising on a regular basis and developing that habit. And in those first weeks, two weeks, four weeks, couple months, they're hard, they're uncomfortable, especially if you're starting from zero but you have to develop the habit. Otherwise it's just going to fall off. Reading more about it doesn't really do a lot for you. In fact, it often will psych you out because you're like, ah, I'm not really capable of putting all these things into practice. So it's about giving yourself small goals, starting off doing this regularly and being reasonable with yourself. Be kind to yourself. One new person per week is 50 plus people per year. That's a lot. Or even reaching out and reconnecting to one new person a week or one person you've already known is 50 per week. That's a lot. Uh, and so keep that in mind. Um, so how do you form a new habit? Well, you have a plan. And, and these slides are, are going to be fairly text heavy because this is meant to be a bit of a, of a takeaway. You can take these slides. They're going to be on my website. You can use them, put them into practice. Uh, and this is something that you're going to be able to, to actually follow. Um, it comes, it's excerpted, or, or I've sort of taken some of the ideas from Ko, my colleague, and from Keith Ferrazzi, who wrote Never Eat Alone, um, which I don't generally love his very sort of instrumental approach to networking, but I think his, his points about developing a plan and a habit is really, really important. So how do you do this? First and foremost, you have to have goals, right? Where do you, with your network, but where do you professionally want to be in the next one to three years? Um, it's worth having a plan, right? If your social capital matters more to your success going forward, are you dedicating time to this? Are you being thoughtful about where you want to go with it over the coming years? So have goals. I want to be in this industry. I want to be at this level. I want to know these people. If that's the case, you've got to start, start there and work backwards. Have a goal. Number two, tracking behavior, right? The more that you can track it and log it, the more you can, first of all, sort of force yourself through the shame of having empty, empty entries, but also you can go back and look and keep track of, okay, who have I talked to? When did I talk to them? Have I actually reached out to enough people uh, today or this week or this month? Uh, I personally think using a to-do app is the best way to do it. We can set reminders um, and until you've developed the habit such that you basically wouldn't forget to do it. Um, and, you know, practice this regularly. Set up the, set up the app, designate it to, to go off, set up the alarm to go off at some point once a week, every other day, whatever it might be, and get in the habit of just reaching out, just pinging. Um, figure out the who. Who goes in this to-do list, Right a maximum, maximum of 50 to 100 medium ties to weak ties that you wanna cultivate over the next year or two. Recognizing that that will update because uh, you don't wanna go over 100, that becomes just too much to deal with. Frankly, I think even that's a bit high. Um, if there's somebody unknown, if you can get warm introductions through a friend, 
obviously that's much easier way to make it happen. Um, if there's somebody you absolutely, absolutely need on your list, right? Think about as many routes as possible to connect to them. Chances are you don't need anyone specifically, but if you want to have access to somebody senior in an organization, somebody senior in a field, right? There's a handful of people you can choose from and figuring out what's the most likely route to generate a good response, a positive response. And how can I tap into that to reach them? Sort into a couple of different levels, right? The B's, these are your medium ties that you want to contact maybe every three to four months and your C's, these are weak ties. You may, may have met them once or twice. You may have actually just have a friend in common, but it's close enough that you can reach out to them, whatever it might be, once or twice a year, put them in those buckets and then start pinging. One to two to three people per week, just a quick check-in, how you doing? Read this thing, reminded me of you, heard this song, had some reason to reach out, was thinking about X, thought whatever it might be. You don't need a, a big reason, but some reason, right? Any reason at all, just to say hello. Uh, I have a colleague, he's in the United States and, and he's a friend. Um, and I would put him maybe in the B category, but he every three to four months invariably will send me an email. And it's really nice. It's, I like hearing from him because I like him and, and I consider him a friend. He's not close though. And it, I know that he's pinging and it doesn't matter because we've developed a relationship already and that's good. And so it's always nice to hear from him. We always respond. We have a handful of emails back and forth. And then we repeat again, three to four months down the line. Um, this is how you develop a habit by doing this over and over. Uh, some things to keep in mind as you do this. Um, the 80-20 rule, as with most things in life, applies here. 80% of networking is simply being in touch regularly, right? The thing we fear is having to meet somebody new when we need, just specifically when we need something from that new person. And that's really tough to do. If you are someone who's developing and cultivating relationships on a regular basis, then when you need something, you either know who to ask already and already have a relationship with them, or you have a handful of people that you can reach out to for those kind of warm introductions. Just keeping in touch, just pinging so people remember who you are, they have a sense of what you're up to, what you're interested in, et cetera, is huge, right? Small goals help you get there. Don't be afraid to take long shots, especially for somebody that's particularly interesting. Keeping in mind, right, a lot of you are in marketing, uh, cold calls tend not to work all that well, um, maybe 3% of the time if you're lucky. So it's a numbers game. If there's someone you really need or some level of person you really need, you've got to send out 20-ish, 25 cold calls in order for the likelihood of one to, to come back to you and to get in touch and be willing to connect. Um, related to that, and I said this is one of the big takeaways, whatever you do when reaching out to somebody new or even somebody that you just know as sort of a bit of a weak tie, do your homework, right? Give people a reason to respond to you. Give them a story about, about yourself, but also why, why them? Why are you reaching out to them? So as a professor of organizational behavior, people reach out to me, especially students or, or uh, research assistants reach out and they say, you know, dear Noah, ask in form email. Uh, I'm interested in organizational behavior and here's all the things that I'm studying, which by the way, have nothing to do with what I study. A little bit of research on my website on NCAD's faculty page would have keyed you in that that's not of interest to me. And so I'm, I'm, I respond just to, uh, I think you've got the wrong person because I think that's the kind thing to do, but most people don't and most people shouldn't, frankly. So if somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, I'm interested in you know, creativity, I'm really curious about music and the kind of data that we are, have now have available that we haven't had for a long time, would love to chat with you about it. 100% of the time, I'm gonna to respond to that person. So give people a reason, do your homework. There's a huge amount of data, you know, don't, don't stalk people, but there's enough data available on LinkedIn, on people's personal websites or their corporate websites, just to get a sense of who they are, what they're interested in, give them a reason to respond to you. Do the work in advance. You want them to spend time on you, you need to spend some time up front on them. Uh, related to my idea around habit formation, recognize that unlike the way that we typically conceive of it, okay, if I just psych myself up enough, if I get my mindset right, then my behavior will follow. That's actually not really the case. Behavior comes first, then your attitude changes to match your behavior, match your behavior, right? Repetition, doing something over and over again is a much more powerful force and much more likely to keep you going than willpower and changing your mindset right? You're much more likely to develop a habit because you've just forced yourself to do it on a daily basis than reading about it, than talking to friends about it, etc. Behavior first. It will be uncomfortable until it's not. 
right? You acclimate over time uh, and be kind, right? Small changes add up over time. If you set these massive extreme goals for yourself right off the bat, you're going to fall short. You're going to beat yourself up and you're going to stop baby steps. That's how you develop habits. And then finally, you know, to, to get connected, make connections for other people, right? We are programmed to reciprocate favors, right? Somebody does a favor for me immediately, even if they tell me, look, I'm doing this with no strings attached. I want nothing in return. You know, please just consider this a pure, pure altruistic favor. The second that favor is done, somewhere in me is triggered this need to reciprocate. It's, it's how we've survived. One of the ways we've survived as a species is our ability and desire to reciprocate. And so the more that you can be somebody who gives little favors, right? The more likely you are to get those favors in return if and when you need them. Adam Grant talks about this in his book, Give and Take. If you can do a favor for someone in five minutes or less, do it, no questions asked. Whether or not you actually need a favor from that person later ever, you've actually built that in and you become the kind of person who's known for those sorts of things. So be thoughtful about this and be the kind of person who does these little favors. Speaking of giving and reciprocity, go from, from developing the habit, building, you know, building the muscle of, of networking to step two, to or my second big idea. Uh, and this is to, to get your weak ties, get people that you don't know that well or don't know at all maybe to come to you. And I think that you should do this by hosting office hours. Um, it's, you know, straight out of academia, right? Professors, they host office hours, students come in and can ask about, you know, whatever topic. Um, fact of the matter is everybody's on Zoom right now. And it's very easy to connect with people that otherwise would be challenging. You don't necessarily see them very often. Phone calls can feel prohibitive, especially if you're sort of out and about all the time. Uh, and so this is what I did. Uh, this was actually at the beginning of, of the COVID crisis. And I had two kids, a two and a half year old and a six week old and getting any actual tangible work done was pretty much off the table because of that. Um, but I felt like I needed to contribute in some way um, meaningfully uh, without really leaving my home. And so I, you know, you can donate and I did a little bit of that, but I thought, you know, what is it that I have to offer? I have some knowledge and some expertise and I've got a little bit of time that I can chunk off. And so I decided to post on LinkedIn what exactly what you see in front of you, um, that I was just going to hold open to anyone office hours and on the topics that I have expertise in and, you know, uh, 15, 20 minutes, whatever. And basically, if people signed up, I thought, cool, I get to talk to maybe some former students or, or people I didn't know. And if nobody signed up, uh, you know, I, I would thank my sister for being kind and signing up and making me not feel totally bad and then sort of move on with my life. It would be a bit of an experiment. And so I put, uh, you know, four hours up in the month of April, like an hour a week. And um, I think 20, yeah, so, so what was it? 16 slots, 20 slots, something like that. And it booked up in about uh, 30 minutes. I said, okay, that's interesting. Um, and then I put May up and I put up a few more slots uh, and I booked another 30 slots in another couple hours. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm onto something here. And so I've now had 50, 60, maybe 70 of these um, discussions. And you know, I, I, they've been wonderful. It's been people I never met, people I'm not even connected. I posted this on LinkedIn. People in other networks found it. I think something like five or eight, 10,000 people saw this initial post. People that I've never met, people that I've, you know, former students from years ago, and I've reconnected with them, people all over the globe from South America to Asia to Australia. And it's just been people that have reached out and just 15 minutes, many of them want to talk about networking, about their careers. And it's been nice because they've come to me and these are weak ties. Uh, and, and these are not people, these are a few people that I've known previously, a little bit, but nobody that I've known well. I've specifically dissuaded close friends from signing up for this and told them I would make other time for them. But it's actually been a really, really low cost way to get weak ties to come to me and to basically make myself open and say, look, I'm here. If you want to have questions, if you have things you want to discuss, come to me. Uh, and this is something that I've now recommended a number of times. I think several dozen people have actually, I've seen on LinkedIn, several dozen people have started to do this and have had overwhelming success. So what does this look like? It's quite simple, actually. Block one to two hours of slots for as long as you like. I think 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes starts to get a little long, uh, especially if it's people you don't know. People might take your time. Calendly is a great tool for this, helps you set things up, keep track of things. Announce to the world 
whatever that world means to you. It's on your social media site of choice, on your company intranet, to an email blast and tell, tell your friends to share it, whatever it is that you're open, right? Just tell people and, let, and give them a link to sign up. Tell them a little bit about what it is that you, your expertise is on um, or what you're willing to talk about. Um, you know, like I said, dissuade your closer friends from signing up because you'll make other time for them. Um, and then just repeat. So I'm now, I just posted my hours for this pat for this month, for September and October and booked up another, whatever it is, 40 slots in, in, you know, uh, half a day. And, you know, yes, I'm an academic. And so this is sort of standard for that, but people in industry, people at, in senior levels of organizations, even people that if, even if you've just graduated from a college, people are going to have questions about that school. Right. And so we take for granted that we actually have knowledge, regardless of where we are in our career, that others might have interest in. Uh, and so I would encourage you to just try it. Don't you don't have to put yourself out there massively, but just try it if you're interested in making these these connections or reestablishing old ones. I think it's a really, really effective tool. Um, but, you know, I know you might be sitting there and thinking, like, that's crazy. I don't want to do this. I have all these excuses. Uh, first of all, you know, wait, I'm so exhausted. I can't handle another Zoom conversation. I will say that I'm an extrovert, uh, and so interacting with other humans gives me energy. Not quite in the same way when it's virtual, but it actually, I find it really, really energizing. I've had very, very few bad calls where that was just not of interest. There have been none that have been bad, just some that were not that interesting or, or useful to either party. Um, and so the fatigue, I actually find that these office hours are more energizing than they are energy sapping. Um, and you know, everybody's in front of their Zoom anyway, you might as well try to connect with somebody in a nice way that's a little bit outside of the work context. It actually feels kind of good to mix it up a bit. Um, right? People are concerned, oh, this is gonna be useless, this is gonna be a waste of my time, I don't wanna deal with this. Uh, of the 60 or so calls that I've had like this so far, I think two, maybe three, have just not been that great. And it's one of the reasons to put it only at, five, at 15 minutes, right? Worst case scenario is if it's really bad, you just hang up. But that hasn't happened. Uh, but if it's just not that interesting, you've got 12 more minutes to suffer through. You can ask something, you know, in a random question, figure out who this random person is and where they're calling from and why. Uh, but it actually has happened very, very rarely. And there's a way that you can actually fight against this. In your calendar, they sign up, ask people to give you one to two sentences about what it is they want to talk about. A, that reinforces commitment so people don't no-show. B, that allows you to direct the question, direct the conversation and in, in the off chance that it's not gonna be, really not gonna be relevant, you can say, you know, I'm not the right person for this and move on. So you can actually do a little bit of screening up front. I've had to do very, very little of that. Uh, some people are worried about someone trying to sell them something. Again, it's easier to do this over Zoom, just hang up. Uh, again, that hasn't happened to me at all. Maybe if you're a senior executive, it might be more likely, but still, I don't think people are gonna do that. Uh, and this is what I was talking about before, right? We, we have, there's a phenomenon in psychology, the curse of knowledge. And basically it goes that what I know seems simple and pretty obvious to me because I know it, it's fluid, it's easy, I can recall it. I learned it a while ago, it's now obvious and easy and I have the background to understand it. The curse of knowledge is that we assume that because something is simple and obvious and easy for us, that others will have the sufficient background and understanding and that they actually probably know that piece of information or skill or knowledge or, or, or part of knowledge already. And the fact of the matter is that's actually generally not true. Our knowledge bases are actually quite different. And so you have a lot more to offer than you think you do, regardless of where you are in your career or in your organization. And so I would encourage you, just try this. Open yourself up to it. If you're gonna find, have no other way to network and uh, while we remain in this virtual setting, I think this is actually a really, really effective and low cost way to try it. Um, and remember that you do actually have a lot more to offer than you think you do. Um, and that brings me to my, to my final takeaway here, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A. Uh, and, and this comes back to this idea of building your own personal board of directors. Um, and, and if you think about a board of directors, right, they're advisors, but they also help guide you. Hopefully they help, you know, give you advice when you need it. They are there in times of crises, but also to help direct you when things are good. And that's the idea here. The idea is thinking of, Mentoring is often viewed as this one-off relationship. Okay, I have this one person or two people, they're my mentors and they're sort of, they serve various functions and that's great and it's wonderful to have a mentor and you absolutely should have a mentor. But this is to get you to start to think about, uh, instead of a, an individual mentor, it's like, what are all the things that you wanna accomplish? And what are the areas that you need advice on? 
because you can actually create a suite of three to six, maybe seven people who you can rely on at regular intervals as this is kind of a team of mentors, basically. Um, and you turn to them for advice, direction, guidance. They're people that will actually respond to you on short notice uh, when you have a crisis or when you need advice just to quickly uh, for some sort of quick turnaround. And so be thoughtful about who, who you sort of bring into this. Um, and I'll explain sort of the how to in just a minute. Um, you know, it can be structured. Some people are more informal. It's whatever you're comfortable with. The point here is not that you should have like a little chart with you know eight seats and fill them with names and, and follow it closely. It's what's com what you're comfortable with and what the people that, that you view as your mentors are comfortable with. Um, it can come from any aspect of life. In fact, I would encourage you to have some peers, to have some, some people from academia that you connected with, right? So that you cover lots of different bases. You can talk to people who are at similar life stages and so they can commiserate about similar experiences uh, and things like that. Um, and and I, was, I was thinking about this concept and I asked somebody who was on my personal board of directors, I said, you know, what, what's in this for you? Like, why do you do this? Why do you give your time? And, uh, and he was kind enough to say the following. Um, he said, I hope at some point in your career, you get to mentor someone like you, just so you understand. And, you know, that's touching and it's nice, uh, but it also, it, it reflects the fact that people enjoy giving of their time and advice and expertise. We all like to be seen as experts or as people who can give, you know, well, well thought out advice. And so this is an opportunity to do that and also to engage people who are going to be inclined to do that. Not everybody is, but a lot of people are. So who should this be? <clears throat> uh, people whose experience and judgment you value and take seriously, right? You want people you trust. Uh, they have good skill set, skill set that you either have and want to develop more or that you ultimately want to move towards. Um, they've got a broad network. They are fundamentally trustworthy. They have your best interest in heart. Uh, and and they're, you're comfortable going to them and asking for help. How do you go about doing this? Uh, in the US, we have a, a phrase, or at least we did when I was in high school, uh, DTR, define the relationship. Um, you don't, don't need to do this. You don't need to ask someone to be your mentor, um, right? The idea is, you know, as you develop this relationship over time, it will become pretty obvious that that's what's developing there uh, and nurture it. Aim high, right? Have some people there that, that you really admire, really aspire towards their career and, and what they've achieved. Um, as before, look for your weak ties, look to your friends of friends for introductions that you can get. Um, figure out how you can help them, right? Reciprocate as much as you can. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future, you'll actually be capable of, of returning the favor for them. Uh, and have patience with this. This is something you should develop over time. It doesn't just immediately happen the second you start thinking about it. Give yourself a year or two to develop the relationships, to find the people, to figure out how you want to engage, et cetera, in order to make this happen. Uh, in case you're curious, uh, this is what my personal board of directors looks like. Uh, the first two on the top left are Piers, my closest friend from, from college, who's actually a senior executive uh, uh, in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles himself. Uh, another professor, two professors in INSEAD, um, a couple of former bosses and still mentors in the bottom left corner, my PhD advisor, um, another professor from my MBA and PhD, and then actually my ninth and 10th grade English teacher uh, in the bottom right, who remains a close mentor and friend. Uh, that's him holding my, my son that's a couple of years ago, because um, that's the most recent photo I have of him. But, but you can see it's, it comes from all walks of life. I could probably use a little bit more diversity there, but I'm doing okay. Um, and, and it's, you know, different aspects of, of myself and my life that I have access to and access to their expertise and their experience. And that's really what, what you want to go for there. Um, so a couple final things, right? How do you engage? First of all, you have to invest the time. You want to inform, especially when things are going well. No one likes to hear from people when just when things are bad or when they need help, right? Regular updates every two, three, four months, again, here's what I'm up to, here's what's going well, here's how career is progressing, how are you doing, et cetera, simple. Um, encourage and welcome and be willing to accept direct, honest feedback. Um, be sure that you listen to what they're saying. After a while, if someone's dispensing advice to you and, you and you aren't following it, it gets frustrating and people wanna stop doing that. So make sure you're listening, you're absorbing, you're taking it to heart. Um, make sure that you're adapting your board. What my board looks like now is not what it looked like 10 years ago. It's not what it looked like 10 years from now. So whatever your needs are, wherever you wanna develop, that's where you need to, to develop the board and seek the right diversity, right? Again, have access across different areas of your life, different areas of the world, et cetera. Getting the same ideas over and over again is not, not something you wanna do, right? It's that closed network idea. 
few closing points. All of this comes from a place of recognizing that people don't typically feel very comfortable doing this. And if you go about this with authenticity and curiosity, that's much more likely to help. Uh, and so what do I mean by authenticity, right? Well, who you are and what you do, there can be alignment or misalignment between them. Uh, and when I say who you are, it's who do you feel that you are? Who is the, what is your identity? How do you view yourself? If you view yourself in one way, but see yourself doing all of these other behaviors, right? If you're networking and you don't view yourself as a networker, that feels inauthentic. But if you view yourself as somebody who values relationships and wants to help others, and that's the type of behavior you start demonstrating, you're going to feel much more authentic. And so when those things overlap with each other more, you're much more likely to feel comfortable, you're going to feel authentic, you won't feel strained and like, you know, sort of like a stranger to yourself, uh, and it won't feel like something that you don't want to do any longer. Um, Authenticity is the feeling of alignment between who you are and your behaviors. Curiosity is approaching the world as if you always have something to learn. Uh, and if you approach the world from that perspective and from the relationship building perspective, you're much more likely to be willing to make these networking outreach outreaches happen. You're much less likely to, to shy away from them for feeling like you're imposing on someone or it's just really uncomfortable. Um, you know, if you're authentically curious, networking won't feel as gross. And if you consider it to be learning or even giving to others, you actually might even feel good about it. Uh, and so that's what I hope for all of you. Um, I will open up to Q&A in just a second here. If you have uh, more interest in this, these will be posted on my website, which is just noahaskin.com, uh, these slides that is. Um, there's more resources there. If you're interested in reading more about these concepts in general, I can recommend these books that you see before you. Um, and also a podcast uh, called The Reliance Project. Um, it's by a woman named Erica Young who works in uh, VC in London. And she has been sort of learning about networks as a layperson, right? Not an academic and figuring out how they, how they work effectively in her life and then reaching out to academics to interview them, reaching out to practitioners who utilize networks effectively. And she's actually built a really, really nice podcast around discussing these kinds of topics. Um, with that, I will say thank you very much. I will turn it over with about 10 minutes to Louise uh, for Q&A and, and I will stop sharing my screen so you can actually see us. Uh, Louise. Yes, I have, a, I have a couple of that have come in, but from my side of things, um, obviously CTAM, we are a networking group. We have close to 3,000 professionals in, in, in our group across the UK and also in the US, so bringing people together. I love everything you said, but what about that, that those people that perhaps are harder to find or don't even want to be found? I mean, there's certain disciplines that lend themselves to networking. There are others, don't mean to pick on anyone here, but such as finance maybe or something like that, that you want to find, but quite difficult sometimes. How would you manage um, things like that? So, yeah, I think it's worth recognizing that people come to this with, uh, with very different perspectives and different, um, uh, tendencies. And so, you know, I think try, right? The, the, we sort of psych ourselves out and think like, oh, if someone doesn't want to connect with me, it's something about me and I'm, you know, I'm a less than a worthwhile person or something. It actually isn't about that. It's about them. And some people just aren't open to it. And, and that's very, it's easy for me to say, like everyone else, it, like it's an ego investment to try to approach someone, meet somebody new, and you don't want to feel rejected by that. Uh, even if it's somebody that you don't find that impressive, you just think it's worthwhile connecting with them. Um, but it's worth taking a shot. And I think, A, you'd be surprised that people are more interested in connecting than we often give them credit. Um, and, and B, chances are within every you know, stereotypical personality type, you're going to find the people who actually stand out and the people since you use finance, I'll stick with that. People in finance who are more open and more willing to do that. And, and chances are everyone knows who that person or those people are because they're the one who's, ones who are willing. Um, and you can hopefully find your way to them relatively quickly. And one other, what do you think in your opinion is easier? Is it easier networking now in our virtual world or is it harder or is it just different? What, what do you think? 
I think probably just different. I mean, I found that the office hours thing has actually been kind of a, it, totally, I did this on a total fluke really. And it's actually become a very powerful tool. And I've had a number of people, former students, friends, whatever, who've done it and actually had similar, said that they've had similar results. And so I've actually found that's easier um, because you're more likely to, to be able to access kind of this random weak connection, weak tie pool that way without having to do a lot of outreach. Um, yeah, I think it's just different, right? It comes with different headaches and different pains and different things that are easier. Um, and it, it, it's also just taking some getting used to, um, right? The connection that you can have with somebody virtually is just not quite the same. I've heard people say, well, you're just focused on them and there's nothing else. Mm, I don't buy it. I think, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, nonverbal communication that goes on in any meeting. Uh, and that's just a lot harder to pick up on, to read, to respond to. Um, we tend to mirror people who we are sort of drawn to, uh, and it's very hard to do that virtually. And so I think we lose some aspects of it. Um, so it's, a, it's an adaptation period for sure. And I think one of the things that comes up in, in, in the chat is very much that obviously when you're networking now, you're very often actually almost in somebody's front room. You're not in an office environment, depending on their home status, you may be in a front room or a kitchen. So it's got a bit more informality potentially to it. I mean, how, how, how mm -hmm. is that? So it, a lot, you know, people project what they want to project, right? And so some people put the, the backgrounds in because they want, they don't want you to see whatever's going on behind them. And that's understandable. And other people let you into office space or to, you know, hotel rooms or bedrooms or other random places. And <laughs> so there's like, there's a certain degree of, of, of intimacy almost that comes with people that you may never have met or only know purely professionally, right? I was telling you beforehand, my three-year-old son likes to roll in usually when I'm on a call in nothing but his underwear. Uh, and now someone <laughs> knows that about me in my life and that's fine. Uh, I think people are actually a lot more forgiving um, even in professional contexts, which is, you know, there's some hope for humanity maybe in that. And I think in the world that we're in right now, everybody without doubt is in the same situation. So there's, it's not unique to one country, it's, it's the world. So yeah. everybody's changing. So, I mean, what you've said today is fascinating. And there's been some messages coming in here. I think you'll see this. So thank you very much. The most use, useful networking session I have ever attended. So <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, and I think there's a lot of feeling that people do struggle with networking because it can feel uncomfortable. Um, but there is the understanding, and I think especially now, digital revolutions, all of those things, that it really is the most important. And how do you address it as an individual? And an individual within a corporation is just so important. So some of those yeah. fantastic responses, great. I just want to touch on one thing that, so right, we're, we all feel uncomfortable with it, people struggle with it. And so there's two pieces of research that I like to cite. Um, uh, one of which is sort of a funny one that, that uh, SNCF in France did when people getting off the TGV. Uh, I've lived in France for six plus years now and I love it here. I don't think I would classify the French people as a whole as like the friendliest, most outgoing towards stranger group of people in the whole world. Uh, and they surveyed people getting off the TGV and said like, you know, what percentage of you had conversations with the people sitting next to you and something like one or two percent if they were strangers. And they asked you, would you have been willing to have a, converse, have a conversation with the stranger sitting next to you? And 60% of people said yes. And so there's a lot of desire to connect, especially when you're stuck on something for three, four, five hours. Um, although you obviously you always want to be wary of ending up in that conversation that you can't get out of. But, but I think, you know, there's desire to connect and we all are facing this internal battle with ourselves of not wanting to. And when I talk about networking, that is a form of networking. You're not out there to make new best friends. You're there to connect with people who view the world differently, who might have something interesting to say or might have nothing at all. Like the serendipity of it is part of what, what makes it interesting and valuable. Um, and just quickly, the other piece of research actually was conducted at the University of Chicago. I think I saw Yvonne on here. Hi, Yvonne, um, from University of Chicago days. Uh, and basically they, they wanted to find out how people responded to strangers approaching them. And so um, this professor sent some PhD students onto the L, which is the public transport system at Chicago, and uh, just asked them to start have, having conversations with, with people. And they surveyed them first, said, you know, 
uh, how happy are you on a scale of one to 10 at the beginning of your commute? And most people said something like six. And how happy would you be if, you know, a stranger started talking to you? It's like two, just leave me alone. So these PhD students got on and just struck up conversations for the 20, 30 minutes of the commute and then handed them an envelope afterwards. And it was a survey. You know, you've now just had a conversation with a stranger. Uh, you know, how, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about your day? How happy are you? And it was like eight. And so you know, we, we like connecting with others. It's just we face these internal battles. And look, some people have their noise canceling headphones on and their face in a book or their phone. And like, that's not your target audience. But people want to connect. We, we are programmed to. And so that's, that's part of the underlying motivation and theory here. And I think we're on the hour, but I have one more question that I can see. I've got my other devices all around me. Um, <laughs> What is the status now? We can't handshake, we can't kiss hello. So virtual is one thing, social distancing and being in person is another. Is there a, is there a new networking uh, sign of greeting and acceptance and openness that isn't a handshake and that isn't holding on to someone somehow? Yeah, that's a good question that I have not pondered. I'm sure it's very <laughs> culturally, very culturally dependent. Um, I don't know. People have done sort of like the elbow thing or that the awkward, awkward like two step where you dance forward and back for a second. Uh, oh, wow, mm, it's no, not nothing that. good. <laughs> okay. No, I mean like that's just that's how you look. It's not that's not intentional. I think that's sort of how you get caught. Um, uh, trying to fight your urges to do what you used to do. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, generally, just don't touch other people at this point. I think everyone's a little, you're safer that way, both from how you, the other person might feel and from a health perspective. I guess for the group, social distancing in mind, maybe we can come up with a new distant version of the handshake. I, I think any ideas that you have will be most welcome. Please send them in. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Noah. That was really interesting. And I know it's been really well received from messages I've just had on my phone. So um, really fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, great. We'll do it again sometime. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good you. Luck. And thank Bye. you for having me. Bye.